Okay, so the next, the, the part three is the, the red. I like to look at the rabbinic commentary, and the reason is, is that, um, well, we're looking at the Aramaic Targum, right? And the Aramaic Targum is a rabbinic translation of the book of Isaiah, and Targum Jonathan translation of the whole of the Tanakh, right? And so uh, we get an, uh, an early or an ancient understanding on an interpretation of the book of Isaiah. And, you know, sometimes we see a lot addition to the text. Sometimes we see a word-for-word -word translation. And so it's always interesting to look at that. I like looking at the rabbis because it helps us to uh, step outside of the box a little bit and uh, think of, uh, maybe about the God's Word in a slightly different way. And um, it's important to recognize that the New Testament text does not diverge from uh, rabbinic Judaism in from the sense that uh, there are there are so many parallels in the New Testament text and so and we've, we've talked about that a lot in the previous studies on the book of Isaiah through um, I'm, we're, we're finishing up Isaiah chapter 37 so chapter 1 through 37 of Isaiah okay so you can check that out on the YouTube channel and the website monsadi.com so um, let's let's start by looking at the Targum Jonathan reading through that and seeing what, what Jonathan here, how he translates Isaiah, see what he has to say here. And it says, Of a truth, O Lord, the kings of Assyria have laid waste to all the promises in their lands, and have burnt their gods in the fire, for they were no gods, they are of no use, but they are the work of men's hands, wood and stone, therefore they have destroyed them. And uh, now, O Lord our God, save us from his hand, that all the kingdoms of the earth may know that thou art the Lord, there is none beside thee. Then Isaiah the son of Amos sent to Hezekiah, saying, Thus says the Lord God of Israel, Whereas thou hast prayed before me concerning Sennacherib, the king of Syria, this is the word which the Lord has spoken concerning him. The kingdom of the congregation of Zion despises thee, abhors thee. The people which are in Jerusalem shake their head beyond, behind thee. Whom hast thou reproached, against whom hast thou exalted thyself, and before whom hast thou lifted up thy voice? Yea, thou hast lifted up thine eyes on high, because thou hast spoken words which are right, not right from the Holy One of Israel. By thy servants thou hast reproached the people of the Lord, and hast said, By the multitude of my chariots am I come up against their fortified cities, where moreover I will seize the house of their sanctuary, I will slay the most beautiful of their, beautiful of their mighty ones, and the choices of their rulers, and I will subdue the city of their strength, and I will destroy the multitude of their army. Okay, so that was the Targum Jonathan, son of Uziel, Isaiah 37, verses 19 to 24. And um, Shalom, Bruce, I, I see you there. You know, thanks for being here in the study. And so um, the, the first two verses here that we're looking at, and I do color code them because when we look at, you know, we're going to be looking at this one and we're this group of, of verses here. So um, the first two verses, well... It, it speaks of, uh, we read how Assyria destroyed not just the nations, but their gods as well, which were which are described here just as wood and stone, and how they are no gods, right? And they're not gods, and they are of no use. I, I like that, you know. Uh, it says, uh, the Targum here, it says, they are of no use. You know, they're useless. Um, and, and, uh Lo mishtamesh, right? In in Hebrew, lo mishtamesh, they are of no use. And um, let's see. Okay, so uh, they are only have made of men's hands. And so uh, I thought this was kind of reminiscent of what God had commanded us um, at the uh, from from the Torah. And so I thought we'd look here at Exodus again, chapter twenty, verses one through five. Okay. Okay, and so um, it says the following. It says, uh, it says here, the Daber Elohim el Kol Hadevarim Ha'Elahlemor. And so the word of the Lord, and then God spoke all these words. Okay, and, and it's here in God spoke at Kol Hadevarim Ha'Elah, all these words, and then saying to say. Okay, and then and it goes. It says, Anoch Anochi Adonai Elohecha. I am the Lord your God, a share chotze chotze ticha me'eretz mitzrayim that brought you out from the land of Egypt um, me'beit avadim from the house of slavery. Okay, and then it goes on and it says lo yichia lecha Elohim acharim al penai. It says 
Um, you shall have no other gods before me. And then it goes on, it says, Lo ta'ase lecha, you're not to make for yourselves a pestle, right, an idol. Ve'kol uh, temuna asher v'shamayim mima'al v'asher ba'aretz mitachat v'asher ba'mayim mitachat la'aretz. Okay, so um, you shall not make for you any graven image or anything in the likeness of anything that is in heaven, right? Um, right here, anything that is in heaven or anything that from anything that is in the earth or under it, right? Or anything that is in the water or under it, right? And then it goes on, it says, Lo, I changed my ink, Lo tishtahave lahem, you are not to worship them. Lo ta'avadem, that you are not, um, ta'avdem, okay, ta'avdem, so you pronounce it, I mean, you're not to serve them. And he says, ki ani Adonai Elohecha, because I am the Lord your God. Um, El kana, I am a, I, a jealous God, right? And um, it says, poked avon avot al banim al shalashim ve'al Rebeim uh, lesan I, so that is visiting the iniquities of your fathers upon your sons unto the third and fourth, uh, uh, what do you call them? To the third and fourth generation. I mean, it just goes. It says just to, to the third and the fourth. You know, unto the third and the fourth. It just leaves out the um, the word generation, but that's understood. And then it is to those who hate me. Okay, and then. It goes on and it says, um, the Ose Chesed la Alafim and and doing grace, okay, giving grace or mercy, you know, that Chesed is the word for grace, and and le Ohave to those that love me, and Ul Shomre meets Votide, and those who keep my commandments, okay, so again. What we see here is is so significant in from the sense that those who love God, those who love Him, they are living their lives for Him, right? They're they're literally living. We we who love God live our lives for Him. We are being faithful to Him, and that means that we are obeying His commands. You know, we need His help, right, to do that. We seek we seek Him every day for that. And the intent here is that the God of Israel is discussing here in Exodus chapter 20, verses 1 through 5, how he is Lord, how he is God, he is king over all, right? And that there are no other gods before him, you know, and, and we are not to make any idols, right, of, of him, if anything on earth, under the earth, or even in the heavens, right? And these words from both Isaiah and Exodus are all about the reign of God in our lives, right? You know, especially like this last verse here in verse 6, in that from the sense that, uh, um, from the sense that, uh, you know, we live our lives for him. I, I was just looking at the chat. Um, Asher means that, yeah. I mean, it can mean that. It depends on the context, okay? And, um, yeah. And so, uh Let's see these these the the question. Okay, so the Isaiah text. Okay, and the Exodus here. And I like the I love this 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 part of Exodus, and um because I feel that they're so full and rich with with content, and the this idea that of the reign and the sovereignty of God over all right, and especially in our lives as His people. You know, the question is that are we willing? to accept the reign of God in our lives. You know, within the context of these things, God said that we are not to do like the Egyptians, right? In the Egyptian moral life was an abomination because it involved idolatry, it involved immorality, it involved oppression and violence, okay? And the Egyptians, they worshipped animals as gods and they held them as sacred. While the God of Israel forbade any worship of other gods or images, okay, here in Exodus 20, right? And the Egyptians lived in a way 
that was an abomination unto God because they worshipped animals as God. They held them as sacred. And, you know, and the Hebrews, on the other hand, sacrificed animals to the Lord their God, which was considered very offensive to the Egyptians. And this is, again, this is why Moses asked Pharaoh that they could go into the desert and offer sacrifices unto God because it was an offense to the Egyptians. And it even says that in the Torah that it was an offense. This is why. And so, um, for example, the sheep were sacred to the Egyptian god Ammon, right? And cows were sacred to the Egyptian god Hathor. And bulls were sacred to Apis, okay, and so forth. So if the Hebrews sacrificed these animals in the sight of the Egyptians, they would risk, they would run the risk of being stoned by an angry mob, you know, because it would be counterintuitive to the Egyptian religion. So uh, that that's why uh, Moshe asked Pharaoh to let them go into the wilderness to worship their God in peace, right? And um, so... There are a number of reasons why God told Israel not to live like the Egyptians. So I, I thought this kind of followed through with what we were talking here. And I, I have a couple of points in relation to that. And it says that God wanted Israel to, to be holy and separate from the nations that did, that those nations, they did not worship him, right? And, or obey his commands. They wanted, he wants Israel to obey his commands. You know, the commands are what sanctify us because they set us apart from the world. Right? We're not walking in the ways of the world if we're walking in the ways of God. And so then be, when a, we are as a people who walk in the ways of God, we then become to him a treasured possession, a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. And I didn't provide the scripture references here, but that's what it says in the Torah. Right? And then God wanted Israel to avoid idolatry and immorality, the immorality of the Egyptians who worshipped many gods and animals and practiced various forms of sexual perversions, right? And uh, so he wanted them to worship him alone and follow his moral laws that reflected his character and will, okay? So um, God wanted Israel to remember his grace and his mercy, right? And his, his faithfulness in delivering them from bondage and oppression of the Egyptians, right? Who enslaved them and tried to kill their male children. That, that's why we see here that he says that, um, I am the Lord your God that delivered you, brought you up out of Egypt from the house of a bondage, right? The house of slavery here in, in Exodus chapter 20, verse 2. And uh, that he wanted them to remember this and that um, he wanted... Because of these things, because of his love for them, right, and, and us, he wants us to be able to then trust and obey him, right, and as, as our redeemer, right, and then God wanted Israel to prepare for the promised land, right, in Canaan, where he was bringing them to inherit as a gift of his, his covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, right, and he wanted them to follow his guidance, guidance in his hukim, his laws, that would enable them to live in shalom and peace and prosperity in the land. Okay, so the these points here il illustrate the significant point of what the God of Israel wants for his people, right? They want he wants us to to submit to his rule and reign in our lives, right? And we do this by submitting our lives to his decrees, right? And to live in holiness to live with justice and to be righteous, to do what is right, to have love for one another, to show mercy and kindness, right? You know, all of these things are what sets the God of Israel apart and his people apart from all the rest, right? And the rabbis say in a midrash, in um, the Mechilta de Rabbi Yishra, Yishmael um, in 20, part three, part one, or 23 and part one, um, they say that anything is called a god that you make a king over you, even a chip or a shard of wood. Okay, so um, that, that's where I get the idea. You know, I, I get the idea that um, you can make money your god. You can make uh, material things your god. You know, you can make anything a god, you know, an idol in your life. If that's what we seek as opposed to seeking the god of Israel. You know, and they say this is the meaning behind that we are not to serve any other gods, 
right, that we are not to serve them. And it says um, right here, velo um, ta'avdem, right, that we're not to serve them, right? And, and this, is, this is an important point, that it is possible to make anything a god and that gods in one's life can be more than simply wood stone objects. And, you know, this is this I think this really brings up an important point because uh when we look at hermeneutics and the interpretation of scripture, okay, and if we take the Jewish hermeneutic, the parodies, you know, you're you're talking about the Peshat, which is the the uh the plain meaning of the text, the simple. You then you got the Ramez, and which is the hint, and the drash, and then the sod, which is the, the mystery, right? And so uh, when we look at the Peshat of these verses, that you look and you look at the context of these verses here, you can easily see how idolatry is basically always referring to some kind of wooden stone idol object, right? And what we got to understand is that we don't just look at the Peshat of the text we look at the hint, what it hints to. We look at um, the drasha, right? The exposition of the text. We look at the sod, the mystery that God would want us to know about this text. So we go beyond the, the, the Peshat. And then, then when we understand, even the rabbis go beyond the Peshat. You know what we see here in Mekilta de Rabbi Ishmael saying that anything can be called a God that you make that rules over you, okay? You know, so that this this goes beyond the Peshat here. And we want to realize that the anti-missionaries will hone in. They will, they will bring it down to just the Peshat. They will refuse to look at anything other than the Peshat. And then they will say that this is only referring to an idol that is wood or stone or metal and money cannot be a idol it cannot be a god and or material wealth can't be a god because the scriptures don't say that you know and the point is is that we have to use a balanced hermeneutic here and we can't just go and unbalance it to one side and look at just the Peshat. We look at what the text hints to, what the text, you know, the exposition on it. We look at all of Scripture. We have to look at all of Scripture. And then what, what mystery would God have us to know? And the, the point is, is that we have to be weary of creating a God that we would go after as opposed to the God of Israel who we are to be focusing all of our attention upon, you know? And, and, um, and you know, I think that, I think that this is, this is so important. And I think there are so many people that miss this point. You know, there, I know, I know people who miss these, this, this significant point about, uh, a proper human hermeneutical approach to interpreting scripture. You know, we, we don't just look at the Peshat. You know, we go, we look at all of scripture and we look at how, um, even others would would understand this. You know, that's another reason why I like to look at the rabbinic text because it kind of kind of draws out these points. You know, like in uh, Makilta de Rabbi Ishmael. Now, um, in verse verse twenty of our our text from the from the the Targum here, it says, "In now, O Lord, our God, save us from His hand, that all the kingdoms of the earth may know that Thou art the Lord. There is none besides Thee." Okay, so here. Isaiah speaks about the zeal of God, the Lord God Almighty, for his name's sake to perform a miracle. Okay, and so I, I found uh, there is a commentary, uh, Sifre, um, do you, where, here it is, Sifre Devarim 4316. And what, what it has to say, what the rabbis here have to say, and it says, and, and you serve other gods. Now, are they gods? You know, as it is written in Isaiah 37, 19, and they have cast their gods into the fire, for they are not gods, but the work of men's hands. Why then other gods? You know, uh, um, Elohim Acharim. Why? Lama, right? Why? Elohim Acharim. Why other gods? You know, it says, uh, for others, they make them gods. Okay, so again, you know, we we see this, this, um, this uh this 
capability in our in a man or a person's life our lives right there you can make something into a god by making it rule over you you know giving it all your attention that's what we focus on right you know the commentary has uh this very short commentary on um elohim Acharim here and on other gods that that it's possible for someone to make a god you know and i am not saying literally okay it's not not a real god you know a false god of course but you know this idea of making something that you would one would focus upon you know that i'm uh, making it a god in our lives right as opposed to the god almighty lord god almighty the creator and i believe that this can relate to anything you know and some people believe that it only you know applies to physical idols you know, if we want to look at the Peshat, sure, yeah, I'll give you that, you know, in, in, uh, just like in the commands in Exodus 20, verses 4 through 5. You know, it says, you shall not make for yourself an idol in the form of anything in heaven above or on the earth beneath or in the waters below. You shall not bow down to them or worship them for or serve them, right? For I, the Lord, your God, am a jealous God, punishing the children for the sins of the fathers of the third and fourth generation for those who hate me. Okay, so this, this command primarily pertains to idolatry, which is the worship of an image or a representation of a God other than the one true God to, you know, Hashem, right? Idolatry is a serious sin that violates the first and the greatest commandment, right? That you shall have no other gods before me. Remember, Yeshua, when he was asked, what are the greatest commandments? That was the first command, right? Um, and, and the love, love the Lord your God, he called upon the Shema, right? And idolatry is also an act of unfaithfulness and disloyalty to God, who is a jealous God and does not tolerate any rivals or competitors for his glory and honor. And so I, idolatry provokes God's wrath. You know, so what we're reading here in Exodus chapter 20, and that it provokes God's wrath and um, brings judgment upon those who practice that and their descendants, right? That uh, who learn those things from their parents, right? And so, however, we on the command on Exodus 20 verses four through five also has this broader implication on idolatry we find in the rabbinic texts, right? And it, it forbids making any image or likeness of anything in creation for the purpose of worshiping it or giving it honor that belongs to God alone. And so this includes not only false gods, but also any creature or object that may become an object of our devotion, of our reverence, or of an obsession, right? And for example, some people may worship or idolize money or power or fame, beauty, you know, sex, sports, celebrities, you know, the you know, list could go on. You know, the, these things are not necessarily evil in themselves, but they can become sinful when we take when they take the place of God in, a, in one's heart, right, and in one's life. And so therefore, the command here in Exodus 20 pertains to idolatry as well as to anything else that may compete with God for one's love, loyalty, and worship. Okay. Um, yeah, Bruce says, to break the other commands points to breaking the first command. It does, right? And um, so God alone... It is God alone who deserves all the glory and the honor and the praise. And this is why we see in John chapter 4, verse 24, what we do, it says that God is spirit and that they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. You know, Yeshua is saying this, right, to the woman at the well. And uh, so it's because of, of who God is, his otherworldliness, right? And um, Yeshua is uh, teaching that God's people are to worship him in spirit and in truth. Okay, and then um, the remainder, the remainder of the, the Targum here, we'll look at verses um, 22, 22 here, and, and, and down to the end. These verses we note here, according to the Targum translations, that those who rise up against God's people, okay, and like uh, you got the Assyrian army coming against Jerusalem and so and against Judah. OK, so they're coming against God's people. And when when an enemy comes against God's people, they're also rising up against the Lord God Almighty. And we note that this is paralleled in Zechariah chapter two, verse 12 it says, for whoever touches you, whoever touches you 
touches the pupil of his eye. Okay, I didn't I didn't put that in a slide, but um, it is written that the the pupil of the eye, and it it doesn't it doesn't say it doesn't just say the pupil of the eye. It says the pupil of his eye in reference to God, you know, to God's eye. We note that um, all, the promise to Abraham also in Parashat Lech Lecha in Genesis 12, that, that uh, these things speak to the Lord God being on the side of his people to protect and to build, right? Remember, those who curse you, God will curse, right? And uh, Deuteronomy 3.10, it speaks of the people of God being called again the apple of his eye when Israel had arrived at the promised land, and Moshe was turning over leadership to Joshua and, and in the Song of Moses, okay? It says Deuteronomy 32. Now, in the Song of Moses, we're reminded of God's protection and provision for our lives. And here, the context is in the wilderness, Bamidbar, right? In the wilderness, which was a barren and hollow wasteland in which God, the Lord God, had shielded and cared for his people. Right, the apple of his eye means that he regards us as the object of his affection, as something that is precious in his sight. You know, the Torah says that we are made in his image. You know, Bet Selam Elohim. Right, we're made in his image. We are created to reflect his glory, and this is why he sent his son Yeshua, so that through faith we can be transformed from the inside out. Just as Paul wrote in Ephesians 4:24, it says, "And to put on the new self." created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness, right? The hope that we have is the victory that we obtain in Yeshua the Messiah and remembering how we love, we are loved by God, right? And we are called to live in his holy ways. You know, it is in, it is this that we have such great hope and that we can praise the Lord God for his great mercy on our lives. Okay. So, um, what a wonderful God we serve. Okay. So, um, that's what I had for um, these verses here in chapter Isaiah 37, verses 19 to 24. And uh, come back next week. And oh, oh, actually, huh, next week I won't have a study. Shoot, I forgot to mention that in the, at the beginning. Um, I'm at a conference all week long, basically. You know, so um, I won't be here. We'll have to continue the week following. Okay. So, uh, but the Torah shorts, I'll keep the Torah shorts going. You'll definitely check that out on the on the YouTube channel. Okay. So, thanks for listening. Bye.